In 1942, New Guinea was divided into two territories. Papua New Guinea was under Australian control. Dutch New Guinea was under Holland's control. The island is over 1,400 miles long with mountains reaching to 16,000 feet. Port Moresby was the only real village in New Guinea. It was also the only Allied base in the country in 1942. The Japanese control the entire island except Moresby from their large base at Rabaul, New Britain. Enemy air attacks on our airstrip at Seven Mile Moresby and at harbor facilities became a daily occurrence. Night raids were also common. It took the Allies two and a half years to eliminate the Japanese from the island. General MacArthur's leapfrog tactics neutralized many of the enemy. Our chaplain conducting Easter services at Mariba, Northern Australia, 1943. We are 600 miles south of Port Moresby, New Guinea. Our three fighter squadrons, 35th, 36th, and the 80th of the 8th Fighter Group, Army Air Corps, have just returned from New Guinea. These are Air Corps personnel preparing to embark on another trip to New Guinea our third to enemy action. Carbines and barracks bags were standard with our enlisted men. A good share of these men were airplane maintenance section people. They were my responsibility as engineering officer. This is Milne Bay, the eastern tip of New Guinea. The coconut trees are part of Lever Brothers' plantation, an allied transport hit by the Japs. The Aussie army is first off. Next come our men. P-39 Aracobras landing on metal matting. We are about to use a wing originally bound for the RAF. P-39s on alert. Note droppable gas tanks below belly, dropped only on Jap interceptions. B-38 fighters landing at Three Mile Airstrip, Port Moresby. This was a twin-engine supercharged airplane and more than a match for the Jap Zero. 
At one time, each of our group's three squadrons had different aircraft, P-38, P-39, and P-40s. Maintenance became very difficult. engine is behind cockpit. The engine drive shaft extended below the pilot to prop gearbox. Because of this arrangement, we fired either a 37 millimeter or a 20 millimeter cannon through hub of propeller. A C-47 landing on our strip. Three young native boys. Our camp at Milne Bay. Palm thatched buildings were common. B-38s from the 80th squadron. These are unrehearsed pictures of pilots after returning from mission against the Jap Zeros. They shot down several Zeros and naturally are excited. Each pilot wears a life vest, 45 pistol, and knife. Fighter pilots were lost frequently, not only in combat, but weather and operation accidents took their toll. Flights were made of four planes each. We usually could get 16 P-38s available for each squadron's mission. Each squadron's complement was 25 airplanes, but rarely did we have that many. The Jap bombers hit us hard this January day in 1943. These pictures are at our bomber strip at Milne Bay. Our trucks, gas tankers, bombers, and fuel dumps were all casualties. We tried to disperse both bomber and fighter planes. You will note coconut logs used for airplane protection in the revetments. As I recall, we had very little warning this time resulting in our fighters not making contact with the Jap Betty bombers before their bomb run. These bombers were coming from Rabaul, New Britain, the large Japanese air base north of us. Jap prisoner with Aussie guard. 
a New Guinea sunset. General Wordsmith, 5th Air Force Fighter Command General, is decorating officers and men of the 36th Fighter Squadron at Milne Bay. The presentation is right on our airstrip in the coconut plantation. Clean, long sleeve shirts and long pants are the uniform of the day. My men usually worked in shorts only. However, later we found that this was a bad malaria area, necessitating more body covering. We were taking quinine at first and later adabrin for malaria. The yellow-nosed P-38s of the 80th squadron are coming in from a mission. This was our leading squadron of the 8th group, with 203 confirmed Jap planes to their credit at that time. Each squadron had different colored nose cones. General Kenny, Allied Air Commander, Southwest Pacific Area, is decorating our pilots and personnel at Three Mile Airstrip, Fort Moresby. Camouflage and sandbags protect building and background. Engine change on a P-38. Maintenance on this airplane was much greater, mainly because of two engines. We were fortunate to keep 16 out of 25 in flyable condition. All our aircraft carried droppable gas belly tanks. The 38s, two, one for each engine. Upon interception with the enemy, the tanks were dropped and the airplane went into combat with full wing tanks. Upon completing a flight, each pilot makes out a maintenance report which the crew chief receives and turns over to the engineering officer. Each crew chief is responsible for his airplane only. This is a young native boy at our Milne Bay camp who has been asked to knock some coconuts down for us. Apparently he knows how to climb the tree. D-25 Mitchell bombers are about to take off from our airstrip at NADZAP, north coast of New Guinea. They are to bomb and strafe the Jap air base at Hollandia, 800 miles west. For strafing, the B-25 was modified by adding two 50 caliber guns 
on each side of the fuselage. Along with the four 50s in the nose, gave the B-25 a total of eight 50s firing forward. In our almost two and a half years in the Pacific, our camp at Cape Gloucester, New Britain, was the muddiest and wettest. The rain averaged about two inches a day for three weeks. I don't think we flew over a couple missions during this time. We had plenty of fresh water off the tents. Mosquito nets on every cot were a must everywhere we went. Most of the time was spent in the tents except for chow or latrine business. B-17 four-engine bomber flying over the New Guinea mountains. Jungle was everywhere and no roads. One of our pilots bailed out three miles from our airstrip one day and barely made it back between the mosquitoes and the crocodiles. He was bitten by one. We land on a river to pick up a downed pilot, an Aussie officer. They are rowed to plane by natives in their log canoe. The hatless pilot is real happy to see us.
As a preface on the next scenes, money didn't mean anything in New Guinea. Everything was bartered. The film that I used to take these pictures came from Air Corps Supply. The price was usually four rolls for a bottle of gin or whiskey. We are landing at 6,000 feet in central New Guinea. Many very primitive natives are here. An Aussie captain runs a native hospital. The airstrip and the landscaping were all done by the natives. One shell for a week's work. One shell buys a wife, two shells buy a pig. The rare exotic birds of paradise are used for headdresses in native ceremonies. We went out one day and shot the birds with bow and arrows. The natives then stuffed them with grass. The Aussie captain taught the men the game of soccer. The men wear tree bark around the waist trimmed with grass for the bustle. There are many varieties of birds of paradise. The red and yellow varieties are the most common. The men could have as many wives as they could support. However, I did attend a native court where the wife appealed to the judge of the tribe and was released from her husband. The pig was the main source of meat. We visited a remote native village where the natives had only seen one white man before. They had never felt cloth and became terrified at our jeep horn and lights. The Aussie captain is showing the chief pictures of himself. First time he had ever seen himself. The natives gathered one day with all their war paint, spears, bow and arrows. Apparently somebody saw Japs nearby. The native interpreter is advising the chief where to go to head off the Japs. We were fortunate to get these pictures, as this was a real war party who actually did kill some Jap soldiers. Bird feathers for the headdress and bustles are common. A beautiful sunset ends our experience. This is part two of First Fighters in New Guinea. Some of the scenes are similar to first real scenes. We begin with Easter at Mariba, Australia, 1943, having returned from New Guinea for rest. Colonel Wise, our 8th Group CO, was just shown. Baseball at Mariba, 1943. The
The shirtless officers are Lieutenant Fred Taylor with cap on the left and Lieutenant Welch on the right. Welch came to the 36th Squadron after shooting down four Jap Zeros at Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. He later became a major with 16 Jap planes to his credit. Subsequently, he was killed in the States. Squadron pilots and ground officers at Townsville. Lieutenant George Ricker puts an appearance as we end the camp scene. This is Captain Ming coming out of his tent wearing Australian flying boots. We catch Ricker again sitting on his trunk. drill is now put on by the Australians. and New Guinea sunset. Squadron had different colored nose cones. It was a very fine twin engine fighter. The, the first planes in our 36 squadron were the P-39s and they are now on alert at our strip at Milne Bay. This is a native boy with our Sergeant Coscarella. Uh, he used to climb coconut trees for us for uh, cigarettes. A P-40 in the background. Uh, these are natives at Mount Hogg in New Guinea. Uh, a beautiful area, 6,000.
Fort Moresby was the first American base in New Guinea. We were there as the first two American squadrons in May of 1942. The officer you see there was Lieutenant Hager of the 36th Squadron. All the uh, people on this island lived above the ground in their thatched accommodations. 